Would you pray with me? Lord, we are blessed. To blessed we are be to be your people. Blessed we are to worship and praise you. Blessed we are to hear your word proclaimed. And so, O oh Lord, today we ask that you would give us ears for hearing, hearts that are open to your word, places within our souls that are fertile for the growth of your Holy Spirit. Make the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts acceptable before you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. So today we are concluding a three-week sermon series called Bad Words of the Bible. And as I've told you every week, the point was not to teach you to cuss. The point was to identify those words used in the scriptures that identify where we depart from God's will and we maybe have the more debased elements of our human nature. Where that is present, it is helpful for us to be aware of that, to be mindful of those landmines, and to avoid that path or that trap. And so we've been looking at these words in the scriptures that identify going away from God's will and, and exploring what that could mean to us. And so the first week we looked at the word kata in the Hebrew, which in English is translated as sin. And we identify that that's a moral failure. That's recognizing that this is the right thing to do and deciding to go off the mark, to, to miss the mark, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. Last week we looked at the word in Hebrew, avon, which is translated in English as iniquity. This idea of being crooked or bent out of shape, feeling as if the law doesn't apply to us. Feeling like we're above it, that we can bend things to our own will. That is iniquity, and it is also not knowing that you're doing it and going forth with it anyway. Today we're looking at another Hebrew term. It is pesha as a noun, or pasha in the uh, verb form of the Hebrew. In Greek, it's proptima, or the Koine Greek of the New Testament, proptima. And that is translated as the word transgressions. Now you've heard that word uh, in the life of the church, but it's probably not one you've said this week in conversation. Am I right? It's not one that's frequently upon our lips, transgression. But it, what it speaks to is this notion of having an agreement and then violating that agreement. Breaking a trust, of going against something. You know, and I brought an illustration today. I have all these uh, pieces of paper here. Each of these are offers for a credit card or some other contract that I've been offered in the last two weeks at my home. Apparently, I really need to sign up for more Southwest Miles and some more uh, credit cards, uh, cash rewards. And if anybody is interested in a car warranty, I have some information for you. Now, in truth, I didn't sign my name to any of these. I didn't ask for them to be submitted to me, and I am not inclined to agree to them. But if I had, and then I had not paid my fee, if I had done this to it, I know I had agreed to it, then that would be a Pesha. Now, if I don't agree to it, it's not a Pesha. But if it's something I've agreed to, it's something that, that we're in covenant together with, then I violate it. That is a transgression. It is to see the line drawn in the sand and to intentionally step over it, to transgress against another one. It's interesting that in the Hebrew, the word transgression or Pesha, it's not ever translated uh, Pesha against somebody or something. And by the way, you can pesha against any kind of relationship, a, a relationship with an employer and a relationship with your community or your neighborhood, a, a pesha against God a, or a pesha against a, a parent or a child. As many relationships as there are, there are different types of pesha. The Hebrew people were accused by prophet Amos of pesha against the orphan and against the widows, against the poor for selling them for the cost of a pair of sandals, for selling them away. But, it, but it's instead of against, it's translated as pesha with something else. And, and that's important because it is somebody that you're in relationship with. Uh, even though in my own use of the language, I'll, I'll say against because that's just how it works in English. In the Hebrew, it's with. And so uh, if you were found to have been robbed, somebody broke into your home and, and they ransacked your house and they stole things, then, then you suffered a robbery. You suffered theft, you uh, may have broken and entering, may have been the, the crime committed. But if the person who had done that was your next door neighbor, then it was a Pesha. Because that's somebody you should be able to trust and rely upon. That's somebody that you look to to help to watch your home and you watch their home. Keep an eye out for each other. That's when it, the word used is different. That's when it's not just a moral failure, 
it's actually a transgression against, a breaking of a responsibility. We know the pain of transgressions, do we not? We are, we are perpetuators of them, hopefully not in any severity, but, but there has been a time in your life and in my life when we have not been trustworthy, when somebody relied on, upon us for something and then we didn't do it, when we crossed a line that we should not have crossed. And you know that when there's a sacred trust, it's more, even more painful, the breaking of that. If a pastor or a priest violates a sacred trust that they're entrusted to and abuses somebody, you know, that's worse than if somebody else had done it. If it was a parent who did that to a child, you'd say that is worse because they're entrusted to the care of that person. I remember growing up, or my kids growing up, being able to throw them in the air and catch them when they came back down. They, whether they knew it or not, they entrusted me to catch them when they came down. And if I missed, now that's not good, right? All kinds of harm could happen. But if I missed on purpose, if I stepped out of the way, that would be a far more severe crime, wouldn't it? That would be a violation of the trust that they emplaced in me, that they gave to me. And so it's important that we not violate trust. The greatest violations of trust in the scriptures in the Old Testament, I see the people of, uh, in the time of Moses, he comes down from the mountain with the commandments of the Lord. The people have just said, I will worship the Lord forever. And he comes down the mountain and they're already bowing down to a golden calf, an idol. And so he breaks the commandments and says, you have broken them. I'm not going to hold on to these and give them to you. We're tearing them up because you've already torn it up in your action. You have violated it. You've torn it up. He has to go back up again the mountain to come back down with another set of tablets, if you recall the scripture. The most egregious case in human history, in my opinion, is found in our New Testament in the scripture that we heard read this morning. And that is the story of Judas. You know his narrative. He, he's looking, it's her, we find out in the Gospels, for weeks for a way to betray Jesus. He's looking for a way to do it. Jesus had entrusted to him. He said, listen, come, be part of my twelve. Be part of my, my chosen people that, that will help others to come and know the way of Christ. And so Jesus had signed me up for that. And he had walked with Jesus, and then he looked for an opportunity to betray him. And to the delight of the scribes and the Pharisees, they find out that Judas has a price. That if they give him 30 silver coins, that he will betray Jesus. And so on the night in which he, he gathered an upstairs room, he breaks bread with Judas he gives him the bread, and he gives him the cup, and he says, I'm pouring my life out for you. He gets on his knees, and he washes the feet of the disciples. In the moment, Judas already knew what he was going to do. Betray God. Betray the living Lord. And so he goes that night as Jesus is in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He comes with the troops, with torches, and with swords drawn. They show up, and Judas approaches Jesus, and how does he signify the betrayal? With a kiss. Kisses him. He says, this is the man. And in that moment, Jesus, who could have called down armies of angels from heaven to slaughter Judas and everybody else there, said, no, I go. I go to pay for the transgressions of humanity. I will be torn apart. I will be ripped asunder. But I do so that their transgressions may be forgiven. As I look through the scripture and the ones that, was, that was drawn, I was drawn to, the to me, the most entertaining, if you will, narrative of transgression of Pesha in the scripture is actually the story of a guy named Jacob. Do you know Jacob? Now, Jacob's story is long and twisted, so I'm going to give you a synopsis a little bit of Jacob instead of every detail. You'll feel like it's every detail, but just hold on with me. And the story goes like this. Judas is born to, uh, not Judas, sorry. Jacob is born to his father of Isaac, and his grandfather is Abraham, by the way, and his mom is Rebecca. And Rebecca, um, she, she has a favorite son. She, she likes Jacob more than her, her other son, Esau. And uh, so one day, when they're out in the fields, Jacob, who, who's able to deceive his, obviously not as intelligent or thoughtful older brother, gets the, 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 ble the birthright from him and is able to swindle him from his older brother's birthright. And then one later day, when they're back at home, and I, Isaac is growing old and can no longer see very well, he says, I'm ready to give you my blessing to Esau. Go make me a meal and come back, and I will give you my blessing. And in that moment, Rebecca goes and makes her own dish and tells her son Jacob, together we are going to trick your dad. And so they pesha together. 
Rebekah and Esau, Esau puts on goat skins to make him feel like he's his older brother, Esau. And he takes the soup that his mom has made and says, here, Dad, it's me, Esau. And Isaac gives the blessing that was meant for Esau to Jacob. Afterwards, Jacob is no longer allowed to be at home safely because he is at risk of the, the wrath of his father and his brother, Esau. And so he flees. You can see the, the, the trajectory of transgression, can't you? You say one lie, you, you violate one trust, and you find yourself having to cover up and cover up and run away and get away. And, and the, the cycle just gets worse as it goes on, and that's the case here. Jacob, he leaves and he goes, okay, where can I go? Where can I go? His mom says, maybe go visit my brother, <laughs> Laban. He's up in the north. He's, you know, and he's back where actually his grandfather Abraham had, been, had lived for many years in Haran. So he goes up there. And as he gets there, he has a dream of angels ascending and descending. That, that God is in this space and, and there, there might be a new future for him. And so he wakes up in the morning and he says, okay. All right, there's a new future for me. Maybe, maybe something good now. Maybe good will come of my evil ways, basically. And as he goes forth, he, he gets hung, thirsty, and he sees that there's a well. And at that well, there's a stone on top of the well. And he goes over there, and approaching the well is this beautiful woman. She, the, the scripture says she's beautiful and graceful. Her name is Rachel. And she has got all of her father's flocks of sheep and goats, and she wants them to be watered at the well. And Jacob is there, and he goes, well, let me get this heavy stone for you. And he lifts the heavy stone, and he puts it over the side. And she goes, oh, <laughs> you're all right. I like this, Jacob. Okay, who are you? He goes, well, my, my mom is, is Rebecca, my father is Isaac. And she's like, oh, I've heard of those names, but we've never met. And she's like, maybe come home with me and meet my dad. Well, who's your dad? My father's name is Laban. He's like, that's who I came to go see. Oh, it's providence. It's good. And so he goes home to Laban's house with Rachel, uh, Laban's daughter. Uh, never mind that this is first cousins. Just eliminate that from your <laughs> understanding of all uh, this. Anyway, he gets home, and as he meets the family, Laban goes, Jacob, I, mean, yeah, it's, yeah, I saw you when you were this big. Yeah, look at this. This is great. Welcome to my household. By the way, here's my daughter. You met Rachel. Oh, yes. And then here's my daughter, Leah. And the scripture says that Leah has lovely eyes. And Rachel is beautiful and graceful. There's a lot to read into that, right? Yeah. So who does Jacob like? You know, Rachel. Well, He's there, exactly. He's there for a little while, Jacob is, and Laban comes to him and he goes, look, you're helping out. I want you to stay. I know you can't go home anyway because of your treachery. So just stay here. Stay in my home. Help and work. And, and it's not right that you should labor without wages. So what, what can I pay you? What would be the right price? What? And he said, and this is what Jacob comes up with. Jacob's idea is this. He says, let me work a, a week of years. For your daughter's hand in marriage, that I might marry Rachel. And Laban says, All right, I like that. Okay, all right, sign here. You work for seven years for me, and you, you who come with nothing have then the right to marry my, my daughter. And, uh, and they, all right, let's go. And he puts that back, and Jacob goes to work year after year. Seven years goes by, and at the end of the seven years, Jacob shows up at Laban's tent and says, It's time for the wedding. Let's go. Let's go. Let's have a wedding. Let's, I'm ready to marry your daughter. And, La and Laban says, Okay, well, let, it's not right to have the marriage without a celebration and a feast. Let's have a big reception. We're going to have a big party. Now, back then, they kind of did it in reverse. So they had the big party, and they had a, they had a feast, and it got late. And I'm sure he kept giving Jacob more things to drink throughout the night. And, you know, they didn't have electricity to light up the tents back then like they do now. And um, he's, at, at a certain point in the evening, Laban comes to Jacob and says, It's time. A time for the marriage covenant to be sealed. Um, go on in to the tent, and uh, you all will be married. And so um, Jacob says, good night. Uh, thanks for your daughter, and I'm out of here. And so he goes in to the tent, and uh, the next morning, <sighs> Jacob gets up. He's like, oh, what a night. Okay. And he opens the flap of the tent, and the light pours in, and he looks over, and he goes, that's not Rachel. 
it's Leah. And he goes to Laban, he says, what is this you've done to me? Why would you trick me in this way? Why would you treat me so treacherously with such pesha? Why would you do this to me? Like, have I not served you faithfully? And he goes, well, come on, this was never a valid contract. You know, in this country, we don't marry the younger before we marry the older daughter. That's just not done. You should have known better, Jacob. Oh, Jacob is getting his just desserts. He's done, he's had his life of treachery for years, so it's, it's coming back to bite him. And that's what happens, you know. You find yourself li- being willing to do treacherous things. You find yourself around treacherous company. And so he says, well, I, I don't love Leah. I want to marry Rachel. And Laban says, well, I have a proposal for you. A different sheet of paper. Since, since this isn't valid anymore, let's go with this other one here. This one says, you get to marry Rachel for seven more years of labor. And Jacob signs it. And he says, okay, for seven more years. And so seven years go by. And in those seven years, Leah and Jacob have four sons together. One of whom, by the way, is uh, Judah, from which Jesus' line comes. Jesus is a descendant of Judah, Leah and Jacob's son. By the end of the seven years, finally Jacob has a chance to marry Rachel. And he goes and he says, can we marry? And it's signed, and they marry, and together they have children, and then they have more children, and they're other people have children that we won't get into. But anyway, it kind of goes back and forth, and they compete for each other and for the affection of Jacob and the ability to have children together. In total, between their handmaidens and themselves, Rachel and, and Leah, they, they have 12 children, the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? You know what happens to one of their descendants, Joseph, who gets betrayed by his older brothers, and sold into slavery, the treachery kind of continues and builds. But there's one last story between Rachel and Jacob and Laban as far as treachery that should be told, and that is that finally at the end of those, those years, you know, uh, or after the marriage of Rachel, Jacob wants to leave. He's like, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I really can trust you, and I'd rather just take my kids and my wives and leave. And Laban's like, oh, no, you don't want to do that. You, you're not going to take my kids, my grandkids. You're not going to just get up and go with my daughters. That's, that's not happening. So you tell me what is the price for you to be paid, and I shall pay that. The scripture later tells that Jacob complains that his father-in-law, Laban, rechanges the salary ten times over during the midst of those years. He serves him for another six years, and in those six years, Jacob creates a situation where he says, okay, I will stay if you allow me to receive as my own flock all the spotted and speckled and black sheep and goats, and all the ones that are not will remain yours, Laban, and I will work to ensure that there's a a growth of the flock, and Laban says that is agreed, but Jacob makes way so that the only ones that are growing in vitality and strength who are getting enough food and are mating are the ones that are spotted and speckled and black. He hasn't changed his stripes either, has he? The end of that six years transpires and one night when it's all said and done and he's afraid of his father-in-law's wrath, he gets up, he tells his wives, that is Jacob does, that we're leaving gathers the grand all the kids laban's grandchildren and everything else and their flocks and they set forth to leave they're off some distance when laban wakes up in the morning and he realizes they've all gone and so he sets out after them and the reason he sets out after them is multifold one is he says this later you didn't give me the chance to kiss my grandkids goodbye How could you do that to me? How could you just flee in the middle of the night and not be able to, for me to hold my grandkids and kiss them and say I love them and and hold my my daughters and let them know that I will miss them and send them forth with my blessing? You've robbed me of this opportunity, Jacob. And so he's angry at Jacob for that. But he's actually even angrier for another reason, and that is when he goes to his tent that morning to worship because Laban is an idolater, he worships household gods, little idols. And he goes to find his idols. They have been stolen from him. And he's thinking to himself, Jacob, in his treachery, in his hostility, in his anger, has deceived and wounded me in this way as well as taking my family from me. And so he sets out with an army after Jacob. 
And as he catches up to Jacob and overtakes Jacob, he says, and God has told Laban not to say any ill or favorable word to Jacob, but just simply demand his idols back. And he says, I demand my idols back and the opportunity to say goodbye to my family. And Jacob says, search, I have not taken it. I do not know. Why do you accuse me of false things? Why are you accusing me of this? I have nothing to do with what you're talking about. And he actually genuinely doesn't. But it turns out when you've done a lot of Pesha, people assume you're going to do more Pesha. That's another lesson for us today. And he searches the tents of Leah and of the, and the maidens and everybody else. And he searches Rachel's tent, but Rachel's not in her tent. Instead, she's sitting on a camel, which is weird because that's not how you welcome your father home. You're supposed to, she's supposed to be in her tent and stand to welcome him and invite him in, and she's not. And she's instead sitting on the camel, and the reason is because Rachel stole the idols. And she's hidden them in the saddle underneath her in, on the camel. And she, when he approaches her, he goes, Rachel, why do you not stand? She goes, forgive me, it's my time of the month, I can't get up, but uh, oh, good to see you, Dad. Take care. So he doesn't make her, and he doesn't search the camel. And so when he leaves... It, she tells Jacob, yeah, it was me. <laughs> it was me. The treachery just continues and cycles and continues and cycles, as it can for us, if we're honest. And this is the warning. This is the lesson for us to be mindful of that, to recognize that, that we are prone to seeing a contract and just tearing it up, that we break covenant with God over and over again. There's good news. Jesus says, I... While I, in Isaiah 53, I was wounded for your transgressions, crushed for your iniquities. And yet he comes to us as a suffering servant saying, in me, you can find integrity. In me, Jesus says, you can find faithfulness and trustworthiness. You're not going to necessarily find it even in those that you ought to be able to find it in. You're not always going to find it in your, your spouse or your boss or your children or your neighbor or your coworker. But you can always find it in God. Every last time. And Jesus teaches us a, pr a prayer. Did you hear it today? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Which is the old English word for transgression. For proptima. For pesha. Jesus says you who are transgressors. I offer you a different and better way. I offer you forgiveness of that. In addition to your iniquity and your sin, I offer you forgiveness and a path forward from your transgressions. Devote yourself to trustworthiness. Devote yourself to integrity. Devote yourself to faithfulness. And know that it is the way of the Lord. And when you come before the Heavenly Father and your time of judgment is nigh, and you come before and you have all the weight of all of your transgressions and all of your iniquities and all your sins, and there's no way that you can enter into perfect union with the Almighty God because of how deplorable that we really are, Jesus says, this one's mine. They're washed by my blood, healed by my wounds, taken through my body. This one's mine, and they are forgiven. They are washed from that. We are invited to be forgiven from our transgressions for all the many ways we have taken the contracts and just Jesus comes to us and says I offer you a whole new one a spiritual covenant a contract of God's love will you receive it you won't always be faithful to it but God always will be there is a better way than our sin than our iniquity and our transgression Christ models it and invites us into it. Thanks be to God. Amen.